welcome everyone. So on behalf of the Metro Society, we'd like to welcome everyone to our live webinar. So today is our live webinar is Living Long-Term Care During a Global Pandemic, Decision-Making and Experiences of Other Adults, Caregivers, and Care Providers in Ontario. And we are delighted to have our speaker today. She is Sarah Carbonell. She also is a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto and also a fellow with Canadian Institute of Health Research. And uh, without further ado, I will turn over to Sarah and welcome Sarah. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, so thank you so much for the opportunity to share my research with you today. Um, so as Alma just mentioned, my name is Sarah Carboni and I'm a PhD candidate at U of T. I'm also completing a CHR Health System Impact Fellowship with the Canadian Institute for Health Information. So in today's presentation, I'm going to be sharing um, some of the preliminary findings of my PhD research, um, which is called uh, Leaving Long-Term Care During a Global Pandemic, Decision-Making and Experiences of Residents, Caregivers, and Care Providers in Ontario. Um, and so as a quick disclaimer, this is an academic research project and myself and my research team don't have any conflicts of interest to declare. Uh, the views expressed in this presentation are entirely my own and I'm not here representing any long-term care or uh, retirement homes or uh, any home and community care support services. This work is also ongoing. So what I'm gonna be sharing today is really just a snapshot of my research to date, but um, keep in mind that these results will likely evolve over time. And so with that in mind, um, I'd invite you to share any feedback or thoughts you have at the end of the presentation. So to get going, um, today I'm going to start off by sharing some of the background information about this research and really what served to inspire my interest in this topic. I'm going to start off by talking about some of the goals of this research, and then I'm going to go into the research process, specifically focusing on the study design, the research setting, the recruitment and data collection methods, and some of the preliminary findings of this work. At the end, there's supposed to be some time for discussion as well if uh, you have any questions. So as you're all pretty well aware at this point, um, the pandemic really hit Ontario, at least in the public consciousness, in March 2020. And at this point, we were really starting to see cases and outbreaks in long-term care homes across the province. And so the government of Ontario introduced a variety of policies to help curb infection spread in these settings. So these policies included an amendment to the 2007 Long-Term Care Homes Act um, to expedite the readmission of residents who chose to leave uh, long-term care for a period of time. So specifically residents who decided to move out of long-term care for a period of three months or less would be given the highest priority to get the next vacant bed that met their care needs. So this essentially meant that they could skip the wait list to enter long-term care um, and so at the time, just for context, in the 2020 to 2021 years, the median wait time for a long-term care bed in Ontario was about 188 days. So this would mean a significant um, amount of time that they'd be able to save to return to long-term care if they only left for a period of three months. And so when this amendment was announced publicly, uh, various news and media outlets picked up on it as a major story um, and started talking about uh, people who were considering leaving long-term care during the pandemic. So you might have seen some of the headlines uh, saying things like, should you move your loved one out of long-term care? And so I was seeing these articles as they emerged, and I felt that it was a really interesting phenomenon. Um, so my understanding had been that people who moved into long-term care typically didn't move out after. And so I was really interested to learn how residents, family care partners, and health system staff were responding to messages like this in the media. And this interest really formed the foundation for this work. Um, so the objective of this work is to explore the factors that influence people's decisions to stay in or move from long-term care and retirement homes in Ontario during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I defined factors quite broadly as any tangible or intangible things that people considered when exploring a potential move. So these factors could encourage a person to want to move or they could discourage them. So for example, someone's fear that their loved one might contract COVID-19 while living in long-term care might encourage them to want to move their loved one home with them. Conversely, um, they might be deterred from moving their loved one home if their loved one had mobility challenges or was wheelchair bound and their house had a lot of stairs. So I was really interested to see the different range of factors that people were considering in this type of transition and um, how they weighed these in making their ultimate decisions. 
So for this research, I chose to recruit participants from all across Ontario, and I chose to recruit province-wide because at the time there was no clear indication how many people were actually considering this type of transition. So I wanted to make sure that I was casting as broad a net as possible to capture all the relevant voices for this work. And so as a quick snapshot of kind of the situation around long-term care and retirement homes, um, there are over 78,000 residents living in 627 long-term care homes across the province, and there are more than 130,000 residents living in more than 700 retirement homes. Um, so these long-term care and retirement homes serve a very diverse range of communities and are situated in all regions of the province. And so for this work, I wanted to make sure that I recruited people from every region of Ontario to make sure that I could kind of speak to all the differences in these different settings. So to understand people's decisions during the pandemic, um, there are three main stakeholder groups that I wanted to connect with. Specifically, I hoped to speak with up to 20 residents and family care partners who had either considered a move or who had actually pursued a move out of a long-term care or retirement home during the pandemic. And I hope to speak with up to 10 health system staff who supported Ontarians in making these decisions. So these staff members could include people who are working in long-term care or retirement homes themselves, or it could include people who are working in the home and community care sector. And I wanted to connect with each of these stakeholder groups because each would be impacted by the move. So residents most obviously would be changing their living environment and their living arrangements um, because they'd be moving back into the community likely with a loved one. Family care partners would also be experiencing a significant change, uh, specifically in their roles and responsibilities, because they would be, be becoming 24-hour caregivers, um, since the residents would likely be moving in with them. And then staff in care institutions and the home care sector will be responsible for ensuring the safety of this transition. So they were really key uh, stakeholders to make sure that the decisions that they made were safe and feasible for the resident and family. So to understand these different experiences and perspectives, um, I had planned to conduct a series of one-on-one -on -one interviews with uh, each stakeholder group uh, over the phone or using Zoom. So to identify participants in these stakeholder groups, I used three main methods or strategies. Uh, first, I reached out to health organizations from across Ontario who had an interest in uh, long-term care and retirement communities. So these included various patient advocacy organizations, health service organizations, and research institutions. And I met with these organizations to um, first introduce my research and to explore their interest in this topic. Then I worked with representatives from the organizations to help spread the word about my research, um, either through uh, publications on their website or through sharing my information in their newsletters. Um, sometimes they also helped directly connect me with residents, family care partners, or staff that they had within their network and that they knew would be interested in participating. The second method that I used to recruit participants was through social media. And so when I started this project, I wasn't a very active social media user. So I started off by uh, creating a dedicated Twitter account and Facebook page for this study. I also created a Twitter account for myself and used this to publish the uh, information about the study and to kind of spread the word about the study and create a conversation within my own uh, professional network. And then the final method that I used to recruit participants was word of mouth. So whenever appropriate, I tried to share information about the study with my friends, uh, family and colleagues. And I also invited any participants that I spoke with to share the uh, study information or my contact information within their own networks, particularly with people that they felt might be interested in participating. This created a bit of a snowball effect because as the ball started rolling, momentum really grew over time through these three methods. So now I'm gonna share some of the early findings of this work. Um, so on this slide, you can see a table that shows the uh, range of people that I've had the pleasure of speaking with so far. So to date, I have interviewed 15 family care partners, one resident, and six care providers. And um, these people have been largely female, white, and living in an urban region in Ontario. Nearly all of the residents described in this study also have had dementia or some other form of cognitive impairment, which had a very uh, interesting impact on the decisions made later on. Um, so I'll be discussing that. And so as I continue to recruit participants for this research, my hope is to make sure I reach a diversity of voices. Um, and so I'm gonna be targeting specifically uh, speaking with people who are living in suburban and rural regions, as well as people who are from a wider variety of equity seeking groups. 
So participants considered several factors when they were exploring a potential transition out of long-term care and retirement homes. These factors were unique um, to the resident and to the family care partner, and they had to factor these in within their own uh, contextual realities. The factors that they considered were largely social, emotional, physical, or environmental in nature. And over the next two slides, I'm going to share um, the eight most common factors that people reported um, through the interviews as things that they considered before a transition. Each of the factors that I'm going to share are accompanied by a quote to give you a sense of the types of things that people were sharing with me. So the first factor, which came up in most of the interviews, was the participant's emotional response to the pandemic. So often participants in the study were experiencing high degrees of stress and anxiety as a result of the pandemic, and these emotions really pushed them to consider a transition for their loved one. Family care partners often described a fear of their loved one contracting COVID-19 as the major driving force between, uh, behind why they wanted to move them out into the community. And some family care partners also described um, serious anxiety and fear that if their loved one were to contract COVID-19 and die in the long-term care retirement home, they'd never be able to overcome the guilt or anxiety that they would feel, and so they knew they had to move them. Family care partners and health system staff described this tension between the family's emotional response and the practical realities of a transition like this. So this raised some concerns for the health system staff in particular, because they worried that family care partners would become overwhelmed with their new caregiving responsibilities once the resident was in the community. Um, as one family care partner, I think clearly summarized this theme. The reason I wanted to take him out was not because of his care. It was purely emotional. The second uh, factor that participants considered uh, before a transition was the quality of care in the long-term care and retirement homes. So perceptions of quality of care were quite mixed among my participants. And in some cases, participants felt that um, the residents were receiving really high quality care in the long-term care retirement homes, and so they didn't feel a need to move them out. However, in other cases, family care partners noticed a change in the level of care and quality of care that their loved one was receiving during the pandemic. So most commonly, family care partners reported a lack of staff in the long-term care homes, and this sometimes led to issues with um, delivering necessary care to the residents. So in one example that a family care partner shared with me, their loved one had stopped receiving um, regular bathing, and this was a cause for great concern for them. The third factor that people considered were policies and restrictions implemented during the pandemic. So every participant that I spoke with had been impacted by the visitor restrictions implemented in long-term care and retirement homes um, in some fashion. And for some residents and family care partners, they had a, like a period of a prolonged separation that led um, for weeks to even months at a time. And so family care partners expressed concerns over the intense isolation that the residents were experiencing, and they felt this was contributing to a severe decline in their physical and mental capacity. Thus, moving the resident out um, of the long-term care home would be an opportunity to kind of give them more flexibility in their lives and add greater uh, freedom as well. Before the pandemic, many family care partners were also visiting the homes regularly to deliver essential care and support. This included activities like feeding, grooming, uh, and physical therapy and mental stimulation. However, um, visitor restrictions had prevented them from continuing these activities, uh, which led to some gaps in the care that their loved one was receiving. That being said, certain policies and restrictions that were implemented in long-term care at the time also prevented people from moving their loved ones out of long-term care. So some care providers and uh, family care partners expressed concerns that if they moved their loved one out of long-term care, they wouldn't be able to move back in um, if things didn't go as planned. And so that actually deterred them from moving their loved one out. Then the fourth factor that participants considered was uh, media and news coverage around long-term care retirement homes in the pandemic. So participants in my study described an overwhelming amount of information on long-term care in the news, most of which was negative. And the media coverage led them to reconsider whether the homes that they were living in were the safest place for them to remain. Health system staff also described the impact of the news, suggesting that all the negative media attention around long-term care had served to dissolve like the trust that they had built with residents and families. And as one health system staff member expressed, it just makes me so angry because I see the media constantly doing this, just making everything seem so horrific. 
The fifth and most important uh, factor that people considered before a potential transition was their own personal capacity to manage the transition successfully. So for family care partners, this meant assessing their own needs and their ability to successfully care for the resident in the community. For those family care partners who did move their loved ones out, all self-assessed their capacity to provide care as high, and for the most part, these transitions went quite well. However, for some family care partners, they simply didn't have the time, resources, and training necessary to be able to become a full-time caregiver. For health system staff, family care partners, personal capacity to provide care was viewed as one of the critical success factors to ensure a safe transition. And so whenever possible, they worked with the residents and family members to make sure they understood the uh, intense requirements that would be uh, needed if they were to move their loved one home with them and to connect them with additional resources and supports in the community as appropriate. So that brings me to the sixth factor that people considered, um, which was the actual availability of resources and supports in the community. So this might include availability of medical equipment, home support, time, or finances. And most people believed this type of transition would be impossible without additional supports in place. So the most common resource of support that family care uh, partners described needing was some form of respite or relief care so they could continue on with their necessary daily activities like grocery shopping without having to worry about kind of supervising or providing care for the resident in that time. However, due to the widespread um, impact of the pandemic, in many cases, home and community supports were just not available. Um, health system staff, family care partners, and residents all described inconsistent availability of personal support workers and nursing supports in the community, and other services like transportation to help bring residents to and from medical appointments or other um, care services were not available, particularly in rural communities. Some family care partners were able to use their own personal resources to fill these gaps, hiring private help or buying home medical equipment. But before doing so, they need to be realistic about how long they could do this for and how long it would be safe to manage them at home. The seventh factor that participants considered um, was the physical infrastructure of their home. So I mentioned this already, but uh, many of the residents that were being cared for in this study had mobility impairments and many were wheelchair bound. Um, so it was critically important that the family's home be accessible so that they'd be able to move freely throughout the space. As a result, some family care partners said that they really had no option to move their loved ones to the community um, because their space wasn't appropriate. And so as one family care partner stated, in an apartment, it would not have been possible, but I live in a decent sized house with spare bedrooms and everything on one level. And then the last factor that participants considered was really the quality of the relationships with each other. So this included relationships between family members, between family care partners and residents, and then between family care partners, residents, and health system staff. So for many, a transition like this would represent a significant diet, change in dynamic between the residents and the family care partners. So family care partners needed to think critically and spend significant mental energy um, considering whether their loved one would actually want them and be comfortable with them providing more intense caregiving roles in the community. For some, they felt that the resident wouldn't want them to do this because they wouldn't want to be um, intimately involved in the bathing, feeding, and grooming activities with their spouse or their child. Um, and so that was a significant deterrent from actually moving out. And then some residents of family care partners also decided not to move out of long-term care because of the strength of the relationship that they had with health system staff. Um, so many of the residents in this study had been living in long-term care retirement communities for an extended period of up to several years. Um, and this was uh, kind of one of the reasons they didn't want to leave because they had formed strong relationships with the staff in these settings. So this was shown in one interview in particular, where um, the resident really felt that they had a great relationship with the staff in their home, and they were treated like an equal. So they didn't want to kind of jeopardize that and move to a different setting. Finally, due to the intensive nature of these transitions, there was often disagreements within families over the transition decisions, and that ultimately influenced the decision made. So this was one of the most surprising discoveries of my work so far, is that there was actually widespread disagreement within families over what the right decision was for the resident. And this put the primary decision maker um, into a difficult position because although they had decision making authority, they also needed to kind of understand the needs and perspectives of their family members to not cause additional strain on their relationships. 
So all this brings me to the implications or meaning behind this work and where I hope it'll go in the future. So when I started this project, I wanted to understand people's decisions um, to stay or move from long-term care retirement homes as a step towards improving care processes, both inside and outside of these institutions in the future. And by understanding these decisions, we might be able to better understand what went well and what didn't go well in this type of transition and where we should have focused our attention to improve people's experiences in the future. Through this work, um, we learned that residents, family care partners, and providers can all benefit from tools and resources that support decision making about transitions. So some tools and resources have been developed like this already through the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute and CanAge. And of the participants in my study who had access to these tools, they all felt they were really helpful for helping them to kind of think through all the different factors that they needed to consider in order to transition successfully. Finally, a major finding of this work is that transition decisions in this case were often not decisions at all. In many cases, participants in this study felt that they really had no choice whether or not to move their loved one, particularly because of the lack of supports available in the community. And this was particularly prevalent in rural and northern communities where they may have been experiencing shortages in support even prior to the pandemic. So this um, provides a really important direction for future policy and research, which may focus on enhancing resources and supports in the home and community care sector to enable people to live at home for longer, if that's their preference. And so with all that in mind, I just wanted to thank you again for listening to my presentation and for um, seeing this early work. Um, I wanted to thank the Dementia Society for giving me kind of a platform to share this work on. And I also wanted to thank some of the funders of this work. Um, so at this point, I would welcome any questions that you have and uh, feel free to contact me. I have added my email to this page um, and I'm happy to put it in the chat as well. So thank you. Right. So thank you, Sarah, for that uh, great presentation and for those uh, sharing those findings. I, I think it's so interesting to the community to know uh, at some, um, regarding questions, anyone from the crowd has any question for Sarah? So maybe I'll go with the first question on my end. So, um, what about the, are you still recruiting? Uh, is there any way, uh, people can participate and how they can connect with you if they're interested in your research, be part of the research? Yeah. Thank you for asking. I am still going to be recruiting until the end of May. Um, so I'm hoping to maybe speak with up to five people more. And it would be great if anyone wants to reach out because they've experienced this or they feel interested in this topic. If they would like to reach out, I would invite them to contact me by email. I'll just put my email in the chat because I know I closed the slides, um, but I'm really happy to talk anytime. Right, thank you. Any other questions for Sarah before we wrap up? Yes, yeah, seems that we have one in the Q&A. Uh, so one question here is, do you find that the responses change it throughout the pandemic? Yes, that's a good question as well. Um, so I wouldn't say that responses changed throughout the pandemic, but there was definitely a lot more fear and anxiety early on. Something that I've learned because I've been speaking with people who moved their loved ones right at the start of the pandemic, as well as people who are still moving them now, um, I have learned that they kind of do that often when there is an outbreak in their specific home. And so it's often when kind of that fear and concern has reached a maximum and the concern that they might actually contract COVID has been the highest. Um, the only trend I would say that I have noticed maybe changing is that with the introduction of vaccines in the long-term care homes, there has been less desire to move people out because there's kind of trust that they won't be at a severe risk if they stay. All right, thank you for that. Any, any other question? Right. Seems that uh, 
we don't have more questions, but uh, I'd like to also thank Sarah and uh, as, I, as I mentioned to for sharing these findings. And um, yeah, so please uh, share with us the final results in the future. And I wish you all the best of luck with the everything in your, uh, for the completion of your research. And yeah, so any, any final, final comments? No, just thank you again. Um, yeah, this has been a great opportunity for me to start thinking through the results of this work. And I will definitely share the results um, with the Dementia Society in the future. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today and uh, have a good long weekend, everyone. Bye now.